Okay, before we get into the Gemara, considering that today is your Shredesh Elul, the first day of Elul, I just want to share a little something about Elul. So you may be aware of the famous marshal, the famous parable from the Alter Rebbe and Lakota Torah. The Alter Rebbe, the author of Tanya, the founder of Chabad, who wrote another sefer called Lakota Torah. It's actually, he didn't write it. It's actually a transcript of his talks transcribed by his brother, his son, his grandson, and others. And in there, in a famous mimer for El, titled Ani Lododi Lododi Li, there he gives the famous example, the famous parable of the king in the field. At El is a time when the king is in the field. This expression is used a lot. The king is in the field, the king is in the field. So just a little context to what exactly this means. The king is in the field, and a suggestive way of how we can apply that practically to our Elul. So the context there is, the Maimah begins by telling us that the month of Elul has an incredible divine energy, specifically the Yud Gim with the 13 attributes of divine mercy. Right, this is when they're first used, when Moshe Rabbeinu asks for forgiveness of the Jewish people, it's when he first Experiences the 13 divine attributes of mercy. So the author was describing this, this incredible and divine energy, it's divine mercy, 13 principles of divine mercy, it transcends the system, a whole explanation. So the author asks an unbelievable question. You know, if you just learned the question itself, it would be enough. Just the question, just the way the author thinks is already amazing. The author asks if El has such a incredible divine energy with 13 attributes of divine mercy, then why isn't it a Yom Tif all for all 30 days? It should be Yom Tif all day, all month, celebrating the awesome power of this divine mercy. First of all, that already gives you an insight before you even get to the answer, which is where this parable comes in. That itself gives you an incredible insight to how the author of use Elo. It's a joyous time. It's an incredible, amazing opportunity here. We should be celebrating this. We shouldn't be working. We should be having the uh, Siddhis Yamtif, for bringing with our, with our communities and with our families. It should be a joyous time. The answer that Dr. gives is not that it's not a joyous time. It is. It just explains why it's not a Yamtif. And this is where he gives this parable. This is where he gives the marshal. The king, who has a palace, obviously, the big city. And to get into the palace and to get into the big city, you have to have a special permit. Not everybody can go there. You got to wait a long time. You can't just walk up to the palace, knock on the door and say, hey, can I have an audience with the king? It doesn't work that way. You got to apply for a permit and you have to speak to this minister and that minister and get past this security background check and this and that one. But then there's a time when the king is in the field, where the king is, in modern terms, on the campaign trail. Anybody can walk up to him. Anybody can put their request in. Everybody can greet the king, and the king is smiling at everybody and looking at everybody. This is where the example of the king in the field is. He's not in the palace. He's not in his, in his world, as it were, which is removed from the world of the people. But he divests himself of his world and comes to the world of the people and says, I want to join you in your world, in your place. Oops. Sorry? Of course, it's always close to us. There's different ways in which it's, of course. And yet the Gemara says that especially now. That's true. And yet especially during this 10 days of repentance, right? So it's true. Hold on a second. It's true. Hold on a second. Hashem is always everywhere is a fact and truth. It doesn't change the fact that there are different times in which different ways Hashem relates to us. So during most of the time, especially Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, our relationship with Hashem is in His palace. He's sitting as judge, right? Sometimes it says that Hashem is sitting in judgment chair, and sometimes it says that Hashem is sitting in mercy chair, right? So the different ways in which Hashem expresses himself, even though, of course, Hashem is always everywhere. The way in which Hashem relates to us now during Elul is al derech dugma, by way of example, as a king is in the field, as a king is not, I mean, Hashem is obviously always everywhere. That's not the point. It's a, it's a muscle to give a demonstration as to how we're relating to Hashem at this particular time, given that Shabbos is one way of relating to Hashem, and the weekday is a different way of relating to Hashem. Even though Hashem is always here on Shabbos a weekday, yet yeah, there's a different way of relating to Hashem. And this is the unique way of relating to Hashem and Elul, in which Hashem, as it were, comes to the world of the person. and says, I want leveling with you 
This is the mashal of the king in the field. This is why it's such an empowerful. The altar is a mucker. The altar is a mucker. This is he's the, this is the mucker. It's a chiddush. Yeah. The fact that the, that it's yivdum the sirachim is not a chiddush from altar rebbe. That comes in previous kabbalistic sources. But this mashal, this parable is a chiddush from altar rebbe. This this formulation. Somehow it's for bringing with the uh, shliach in Morocco over the kinnas hashluchim last year. Rabbi Banon. Rabbi the Dayan Rabbi Banon here. His son is the Chabad Shliach in Morocco. And he told me that there's taka a month, one month a year, when the king walks through the streets, the king of Morocco. And anybody who wants to can go up to the king, say hello to him, shake his hand, take a selfie picture. It's a real thing. It's like the king walks in the field, what comes to the people? I'm just saying it happens to be the, exact, it happens to be the case in Morocco. Depends. There were certain kings who did come down, but then there's other part. No, no, it's not like they had a specific time they did, but it happened when kings did that, when they wanted favor from the people, come to the people and be nice to them. So what does this mean? What, what, does, this, what does this mean, practically speaking? So this doctor does not say, this is I'm suggesting as follows. We talked about this a little bit last Shabbos during the, during the Tanya Shir. There's two ways in which you can think of the fact that Hashem knows our thoughts. There's two ways to think about it. One way to think about it is very scary. It's very scary. It's probably people's biggest fear is people should know their thoughts. If people knew every thought I have, it would be... It's very scary. Nobody wants everybody to know their thoughts. So you think of Hashem knows all my thoughts. It could be very scary. All of my dark, dirty secrets... Alan, it's not, it's not scary. For most of us, it could be scary. Sorry? Yeah. So it could be a very scary thought. On the other hand, on the other hand, it's not just, it's not a scary thought. It's a very comforting thought. Why is it comforting? Because thinking someone else's thoughts can also lead to extreme empathy. That's where empathy comes from. You're supposed to put yourself in the other person's shoes. So if Hashem knows all my thoughts, he doesn't just know the thoughts where I'm about to sin or my desires for negativity. He also knows deep down how much I would love to be connected with him all the time. He also knows deep down how much of a fight I'm putting up with the other negative thoughts that he knows about. He also understands the struggles I've put up with to come here, knows the struggles I'm about to face, knows the strengths that I have and weaknesses that I have. All of it. So it's not a scary thing that Hashem knows my thoughts. It's very comforting. I've heard it described as a scary thing. That's only half the picture. That's like saying Hashem only has all the bad thoughts. What about all the deep, what about all the good things? What about all the, the, the what about the, the inner struggle, the inner turmoil I put up with? Hashem also knows that. So Hashem coming down to the, you know, it's, when Hashem sits in judgment, as it were, it comes Rosh Hashanah, and you're in, Hashem is in his palace, and the Jew is invited into the palace. That's, that's the mushal. That's the parable there. So there are rules and regulations, and you have to crown Hashem as king, and you have to live up to certain standards. You can't come into the palace with dirty, dirty boots. But when the king comes to the field, and your boots are dirty, so? So? The king's, come, the king's leveling with you, as it were. The king's coming down to your world, to your place, and saying, where do you want to go? Where do you want to get to? Hold your hand and walk you through it. So you think of teshuvah in that way. It's not a teshuvah of, oy vey, the judgment day is coming. What am I going to do? I better... Hashem is coming to my world and says, okay, I know what your hold your look like. I can see you're wearing overalls and your boots are dirty. And this is your job. You got to flip manure. You know, that's, that's what they're doing in the field. When the kings come to the field, what do you think the guys are doing there? They're churning manure. Possibly, I don't know. I'm just using an extreme example to make the point. Now, Shem knows the case, that, that that's your job. And he knows that, that, that you get dirty when you're doing that. Metaphorically, you're fighting with the Yetzirah. And sometimes you, you get dirty. Sometimes you lose. And sometimes it's this way. And sometimes it's that way. And Shem comes down to the field. And he greets, and this is the Lashon al he greets, he greets everybody with a smiling countenance, with a loving face. And says, Rosh Hashanah is coming in a month. 
Where do you want to go? Where do you want to get to? Where do you want to go? I understand it all. I know it all. I know, I'm in your world. I'm in your field. I know what it is. Where do you want to get to? Now, when you think of the Ebesh, when you think of Hashem in that way, the teshuva there is no longer because you're afraid of God so much as how could you let Hashem down with all the love he's bestowing upon you, with all the grace, with all the empathy of Hashem leveling to you in your dirty world. How could you let Hashem down like that? And that's how the parable continues. And as the king goes into the palace, he brings the people with him. And then Rosh Hashanah happens. So the, the teshuva of Elul, it's not as if, as many people imagine it, unfortunately, as if, not literally, but they'll imagine this metaphorically, as if Hashem is standing there with his arms folded. How are you doing? You messed up here, you messed up there, you messed up there. Oh, oh okay, you're doing a couple more mitzvahs. It's balancing out. That's, that, that's, that's, not, that's not our relationship with Hashem. That's not our relationship with Hashem. And we say to Rosh Hashanah, Hashem doesn't want... The, he doesn't want the wicked to die in their wickedness. But rather, he should return from his ways and, and live. So Hashem comes into your world, into all the dirt and the mud of your world, and says, where do you want to cling? Where do you want to go? When you think of Hashem in that way, so this is how that explains why there's not a Yom Tif. A Yom Tif is when you leave your world and you escape to a world that's godly. That's what a Yom Tif and Shabbos is. It's disconnected from the rest of, your, rest of your life. It's an oasis to escape from your life. That's Shabbos and Yom Tif. Hashem lifts you into His world. Whereas in Elul, it's not that Hashem lifts us into His world. Hashem comes into our world and works, is, help, is working with us. Which leads to another related point. When it comes to Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, it's very easy to ride the wave. Because Hashem invites you to the palace. You're in Hashem's world. So it comes to Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur and plow the whole Tishrei. You, you can really do no work and still be on a high. Because it's bang, bang, there's a shana, yim, kippur, there's a shayfa, there's a lulav, there's a, it's, it's happening, it's a febrang, and, and, and then there's a singing, and then there's a... It's, you know, it's so happening just by the circumstances that Hashem made a yom for. He elevates us into his palace that we could be doing nothing, and yet we're inspired. Because in El, we stay in our world. It's not a yom tif, it's a regular weekday. Hashem comes levels into our world. So Hashem is looking at us and saying, where do you want to go now? What are the steps you want to take? I'm going to be with you. I'm going to hold your hand because I know what it's like and I understand the struggles. And I'm going to be with you in your, in your fight as you clean your muddy boots. But you have to start doing the work because this is your world. It's not mine. Hashem is not giving us an oasis for, as an escape from the rest of the year called Elul. Shabbos is an escape from the week. To re-energize so you can take that energy into the week. But it's still an escape from the week. El is not an escape from the rest of the year. You're still, it's a weekday. But Hashem levels as it were, comes his Yudim Nisarachim, the divine mercy, is invested in your regular life to hold your hand as you make your, as you make your changes that you're hoping to achieve and gain as we approach, as we approach Hashem Shoshana. So in that sense, it's a very joyous time. It's a very uplifting time. The ultimate tshuva of simcha, tshuva out of joy. Tshuva out of joy because of the joy you know that Hashem is holding your hand as you're going throughout the whole way. Even as you shed some of the, some of the mud that you may have picked up throughout your work in the fields. So that's a little uh, mini fabrengen on Elul. Sorry? Yeah, of course, I didn't make up what I said. So for there, the marshal there is when, that's, when the king invites the subjects into his palace. It's a different kind of closeness. It's a different kind of closeness than when Hashem becomes level to your world, as it were, versus, the, versus a closeness when Hashem elevates you to his world, as it were. It's a different kind of closeness. That's right. So one is Hashem is coming to your world and saying, where do you want to go? Like, just look at weekday versus Shabbos. It's a similar kind of thing. But in Elul, it's an elevated weekday. It's Hashem Mamash coming into your world to help you grow. Whereas Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, Hashem Shuba, is you're elevated into Hashem's palace. You're living in like this. That's the point. Closer because 
because you're in that, you're in that level. That's why it's, that's correct. You're, you're one step above the rest of the world during the, during the, during the Shani and Kippur, the 10 days of repentance. Whereas in Elul, you're still in your world. But in your world is where Hashem is willing to work with you to, to elevate. Nope, the Rambam does not. No. But interestingly enough, since you mentioned the Rambam, interestingly, the Rambam does not, when it comes to Hilchas Hashanah, the Rambam does not tell us what the message of Shafer is, what Shafer is about in Hilchas Hashanah. In Hilchas Tshuva, he tells us what the message of the Shafer is. In Hilchas Tshuva, he says, the Shafer is like a wake-up call, even though it's like Zeres HaKosov, there's still a message, and it's a wake-up call, which is interesting. Why does he explain it in Hilchas Tshuva, not in Rosh Hashanah, not in Shafer? They've explained this elsewhere. Maybe before we get to Rosh Hashanah, we'll explain that. Why it is that the Rambam tells us the message of the Shafer, not in the loss of Shafer, but in the loss of Teshuvah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The Yerat Rebbe describes that. The Yerat Rebbe describes that. The Yerat Rebbe describes that feeling as a person should think of every sin as if he's taking Hashem and dragging it into the toilet. He uses pretty graphic terms. That's the idea. So it's both empowering, you know, it's, it's both empowering and simultaneously heavy. In other words, Hashem is with you. So what does that mean? It's two things. Hashem is with you, you better shape up. Hashem is with you, amazing. He's holding my hand as I'm going through the struggle. Right? It's like the same two ways of thinking, you know, Hashem knows all my thoughts. Oh my, oh my gosh, He knows all my thoughts, they're terrible. Hashem knows all of your thoughts, even the struggles, even the fights, even all, even your true hopes and deep dreams of what you really want to be and how you really want to get better. Even that Hashem knows. And Hashem is willing to hold your hand as you progress in, in, getting, in, in getting in the direction you want to go. So it's, it's important to, it's always important, there's two things you always have to have when you're doing these, when there's inspiration. Whatever the inspirations are, you have to have the big picture, the inspiring element of it, and you have to have a very specific zeroed in space in which you're going to focus that energy. So you can think of Elul as a, this mind shift. Hashem is with me, he's holding my hand, and he's taking me on this journey. It's a very beautiful thing. It's very uplifting. It's very uh, heartwarming. Now take all of that and find a specific area in which you're going to say, okay, so Hashem is with me. Now I'm going to use that energy to fix X, to get rid of X problem, to acquire X positive, whatever. Take all that feeling and make sure you hone it in to one specific uh, things that way you can always identify and say that's what I did on Elul and come to Rosh Hashanah like that it's a different Rosh Hashanah very very different Rosh Hashanah yeah, the truth is a person has to have an Elul plan what's the Elul plan not just to learn something new or, or what, what, what are the what's the specific thing about me that needs to change either shedding something negative or usually better and more effective is acquire something, something good, something positive, whatever it is. I'm going to start smiling more at other people. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Whatever, whatever, whatever. Or more scrupulous about my Shabbos, about my, my tefillin, whatever the thing is. But you're taking all that energy you put into something specific. You say over the next month, I'm going to acquire my habit adjust my habit to match X, that'll be a, that'll make it a Shoshana, whole, whole different experience. You come to the king's palace and you told him, the last month when you were with me, here's what I did. Here's what we did together. Now, now that's a real, that's going to be a real Rosh Hashanah. Or you say, thank you Hashem for giving me the courage to, to, to not go there anymore. Right. Okay, so I don't know if we have time to continue, continue in the Gemara, but I want to do a small correction from last time. At the end of the Gemara, we had Ravina, which said Gizeh Shav from the word Etzem, comparing not eating a Yom Kippur, not working on Yom Kippur, 
both have the word etzem hayem hazeh, the essence of this day, which is an extra word. And therefore we derive that just like there is an actual prohibition against working on Yom Kippur, there's also a prohibition against eating on Yom Kippur, not just a positive commandment to fast. But then the Gemara said, and this is where I mistranslated, where I misexplained. Then the Gemara says, no, there is extra. There is an extra phrasing. And the Gemara went through five times that um, the prohibition of working and the prohibition of eating or the commandment to fast and the prohibition against working is mentioned is five times. And the Gemara went through each of the five times what they're needed for. And you only need four. One for no working by day, one for no working by night, one for not eating by night, one for fasting by night, one for fasting by day. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, it's five times about not working on Yom Kippur. I'm sorry. All five are about not working on Yom Kippur. Once for not working by night, once for not working by day, once for punishment, excision by night, once for punishment, excision by day, and therefore there's one extra one. So I, I had said that when the Gemara said this, it's backing up Ravina. That's incorrect. The Gemara is going back to the original Brisa. The original Brisa, which suggested, right, the Gemara, this whole discussion started when we quoted a verse, which said, you should fast on this day and don't do any work. And the Gemara went back and forth to thinking why it would be extra. And the Gemara wanted to say it's not extra because you, you can learn from a, how much the more so from the other one. Right? And the Gemara basically said that they cancel each other out. Because they cancel each other out, therefore, lights are out. It's fine. Um, because they cancel each other out, therefore, uh, they're not extra. Right? You need to have the extra verses to see each one because they, don't, they cancel each other out. The Gemara is now commenting and saying, no, it is extra because you have five. So this is not a backup to Ravina, as I had stated, but it's actually to reaffirm that which the Braissa had said, asserting that there is an extra verse. An extra verse with respect to not working on Yom Kippur, and that extra verse with respect to not working on Yom Kippur will teach us that there is a prohibition to the other one, to not, to not eating. Somewhat clear? Watch the other video on YouTube, you'll understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> Right. Okay, but the, the bottom line is, just getting back to that Gemara, the bottom line is that the Gemara is telling, finding us a free verse with respect to the prohibition of working so that that free verse can be used to teach us something about fasting. Namely, that fasting has a prohibition. That's the, that was the exercise we tried doing last time. And we, the, we, we, right. So we, we, we couldn't find a free verse because each time we tried to say that we don't need the verse to tell us not to, uh, that, you have to get, that you get punished on Yom Kippur because you learn it by uh, how much the more so of the other one. But because they can cancel each other out, because they each had a, had a stringency over the other, we couldn't use logical deduction to prove one thing from the other because they each had a, link, a stringency. So we needed to find an actual free verse not just a free verse because the idea in the verse could have been learned by logic because the logic didn't work. The logic failed considering that each had a, had a stringency. That's correct. So Ravina is suggesting that there's a free word called etze. So, oh, so that's when the Gemara says, no, there is an actual free verse because we have five total, the fifth one is free. And therefore, we can do our original learning one from the other. Yeah. Whereas I had said that the Gemara here is backing up Ravina. It's not the case. The Gemara is going back to its original idea that there's a free verse and telling us how we got a free verse. We got a free verse because there are five total. And the fifth one is free. Okay, if it wasn't 100% clear, it's okay. We're going to go forward, God willing, on Monday. A wonderful Shabbos, a wonderful Chaydesh. We should indeed use this wonderful opportunity to get a little bit better than we were last year, at least. Good chaydesh.